Hello and welcome to my presentation on the inner battle of the human condition, how to start mastering your thoughts and emotions through inner alchemy. My name is Melissa Arnautovic and I'm a conscious educator. My purpose in life is to empower people to expand their consciousness and live their true selves. Something that's very difficult to do in a world that is ensuring that you are anything but your most authentic self. I have more than 15 years of experience in various different roles. I used to be in the corporate world. I worked with thousands of people across 80 countries directly and now indirectly many, many, many more. Um, with the beauty of the internet, I digitally work with many people as well as in person. Um, my modalities are very varied across various human sciences and throughout my own applied knowledge and experience in my own life and with others. The purpose of any of my trainings, workshops, teachings and courses is to enable you to live a life of meaning, purpose and in the positive trajectory to be in alignment with laws of the universe and not against them. As we dive into this presentation, I have three principles I would like you to consider as you listen to the knowledge and the wisdom that you're receiving. And you will be getting some tools as well for application. Consider it a mini workshop, if you will. I ask you to approach with willful curiosity. When you approach anything that you're learning for the first time or learning new, always approach with a sense of an open mind and that you have something to learn. When you do this, the likelihood that your brain will actually find something that's useful and that you can learn will increase exponentially. I ask you to focus on the knowledge I'm sharing and how you can apply it in your life rather than specifically on me um, or my personality or who it is that I am and really focus on the content and the information. It's very common for people to look at whether or not they resonate with a speaker, but ultimately what's most important is the message and not the messenger. And lastly, I'm not here to make you do anything. I'm not here to make you believe anything. I'm here to share with you important information and knowledge that can empower you, but you must use your own free will and discernment as you learn to choose for yourself how and what you're going to use this information for to apply and empower your life. Okay, so let's dive in. The theme of this conference is convergence and we're talking about unity, focus and action. And I love that because I am all about action orientation. There is a lot of horrible, crazy things going on in the world right now. There is a lot of madness and there is a lot of truth coming to light. However, at the same time, a lot of that truth is coming with just the information and very little resolutions, very little options for solutions. And therefore that leaves a lot of people feeling sort of helpless and hopeless. Perhaps you feel that way too. So I always like to focus on what can we do? What can we do? And the most important thing we must remember is that the one thing that we have full control over is ourselves, our own choice in terms of our internal world and how we react to the external world. That's why my presentation is focused on the inner alchemy of your thoughts and emotions. So why do you do what you do? Why does any human being do what they do? Every action that you take is a direct result of your current focus on a thought and emotion that is choosing either unity or separation. That is why you do what you do in any given moment. It is always an action that is a result of both a thought and an emotion that's choosing either unity or separation, that's choosing either a positive or a negative enforcement loop. And we're going to get into that. But that is the basis of it. And this is the basis of what anyone does in life. They're either trying to run towards pleasure or run away from pain if they are still in their lower natures. However, you can train and get into the higher natures, which gives more of your own control back. And we're going to get into that. So what is the human condition? Why am I talking about the human condition? What is that? The human condition is the fact that you are consciousness. You are conscious awareness, okay? That's the real you. The soul that's inspirited this body is consciousness. And your aspect of consciousness, we can call it awareness. It is the real you behind the thoughts, the emotions, and the actions, all right? But your consciousness in a human body and your human body has instincts, your human body has desires, it has needs, okay? It has what we would call your lower natures and your consciousness is your higher nature, okay? So you have your higher natures over here, your consciousness, your awareness, and then you have your lower nature over here, which is your body and your direct sort of reactive instincts. And your whole life journey is this part in the middle. Your entire life journey is you learning, growing and evolving to move through 
and getting you know in control of your lower natures and rising into raising consciousness and becoming more and more of your true self which is your higher natures your higher awareness that is what the human conditioner is and that's why it's an inner battle because that's quite literally a battle within yourself it is your instincts versus your awareness and if you don't have the tools if you don't know if you're not educated on how to evolve those things if you're not educated on how to master yourself then you will become a slave to your lower natures as have many people become not by accident because the human condition is trained into us as the wonderful dr david hawkins taught us with his hawkins scale every single emotion you can think of it like this represents a state of consciousness every single emotion represents a state of consciousness why because our emotions is energy and motion our emotion is what literally makes us human. That's what makes us unique as human beings is our emotions. And we have different states of consciousness, which are different emotions. And quite literally our ability to go between those is an alchemizing process. We can transmute lower natures, we can transmute the lower emotions into higher ones and vice versa. Now, let me be super clear, no emotion is bad. There are not bad and good emotions, there are negative emotions and there are positive emotions. The negative emotions are the emotions you see on the lower end of the scale here. And that just means that they feel bad in your body. That's why they are negative. And, and they are a signal telling you in this current moment, there is something wrong, something's not okay, and something needs to change. Okay, so always remember your emotions are always serving you. And they are giving you a signal as to something that's currently not okay in your environment and you need to pay attention. Your higher emotions, however, are a different state of consciousness. Your higher emotions are creative, expansive, and life-enhancing states of consciousness. They're not the survival ones. They're not the, the there's something not okay. They're the ones that are embracing more of your true nature. They come out in a safe space and they are what allow us to create everything we've created in this world through our imagination and our literal creative ability that's our gift from the creator now in order to get to those higher states of consciousness that is our literal this is life this is our conscious growth journey and by the way this is not linear you're looking at a scale that looks linear but it's not like that it's not like you get from grief to fear then desire and it's like hitting points on a scale it is fluid this is not static it is fluid that's why it's a life journey and every single there's context, every situation in your life, depending on how, how far you are in your life, how much life experience you have, what traumas have you gone through, what life experiences do you have, will depend on how you will respond to the stimulus in your environment and how much you've grown. It's like, haven't you ever noticed that something that once triggered you so badly caused you so much pain and grief that let's say a few years down the line, you experience a similar situation but your reaction is completely different. Your reaction comes from a place of, let's say, acceptance or neutrality. Yet the situation is objective and the same, but your perspective and the way you viewed it is completely different because you shifted your state of consciousness. You learned and you grew. You, you, you went up the conscious evolution journey. You expanded your consciousness and you can no longer look at the same events the same way if you learned the lesson. If you didn't learn the lesson, the pattern will repeat until you get it, all right? So courage on the scale is the first point of the scale where we actually start to head into the positive emotions. Every emotion below courage is a negative emotion, meaning it's a warning signal, it's something is not right, and it's, it's triggering that something in your life needs to change, okay? Everything above courage is the expanded emotions. It's expansive of life, it's where you're actually creating your reality. Courage is also the first place where strength comes in and personal responsibility. It's when you realize that you actually have a choice. You have a choice as to how your life's gonna turn out. You have a choice as to how you respond to every situation. And you actually have the ability and the agency to get yourself out of the lower emotions. You have the ability to not stay stuck in shame. You have the ability to not say, stay stuck in guilt. You have the ability to get out of anger and so on. OK, whereas when you're stuck in those lower emotions, you have a victim mentality and you're saying, I'm just a victim of circumstance and I'm just emotionally reacting to everything happening around me. And everyone can basically just play me like a doll. They can manipulate me in any which way they want. You see the difference. That's the power differential. That's the difference between force 
below courage and power above courage. Power meaning your inner power, your inner power shining forth, which empowers you and empowers others. Force is where someone else is enforcing their will onto you and you feel forced to react in the way that you do in the world. And therefore it's very contractive and it's very destructive of life. Now, unfortunately, the majority of humanity is um, in, the, in the frequency of fear, meaning that they are simply in constant survival mode. Now think about this. If you are constantly in survival mode, like every day, all you're ever thinking about is, I just need to pay my bills. How am I gonna get food on the table? I just wanna get through this day without my boss screaming at me. I just wanna get through this day without somebody else getting into an argument with me. I just, I just wanna survive, I just wanna survive. Do you think you're going to be making the best conscious decisions of your life? Absolutely not. Do you think you'll be taking new chances and new opportunities? Absolutely not. You're going to be very afraid and therefore you're going to be doing what's familiar to keep you safe. And that's where most of humanity is right now. And that's why the shift in consciousness cannot happen until people move out of the fear paradigm and go up in the scales of consciousness. And that, my friends, is the human condition summarized as quickly as I can. Please remember, this is an extremely deep topic and we're going through this relatively quickly. But I want to get this information out to you and I want to get you some really practical tools that you can utilize to transform your life today. So people often question, like, is human nature then inherently good or evil? M many people will say it's evil. Humans are naturally evil. In fact, there's, you know, there are many sort of well-esteemed scientists and philosophers that confirm, for example, you know, the whole concept of Darwin's theory of evolution, which is still a theory because it was never proven to be true. And even Darwin himself said, I hope this is not true. And he based it only off of what he knew about animals. It was never proven to be true for humans. Then you have, for example, the book written by um, uh, Richard Dawkins, I believe, The Shellfish Gene, that we're just selfish. You know, humans are inherently selfish and that's everything's, a, everything's about um, competition and so on and so forth. But that's absolutely not the case. That's not the case for human nature at all. Um, human nature is inherently good, okay? The human condition itself, what I've explained to you in the prior slide, is not human, con human nature. It is a condition, meaning it's been conditioned into us. Very important. You see here on this picture, the three sort of layers of the brain that we have. I'm gonna go through this very briefly, but this is a deep co concept. Our oldest part of our brain is our reptilian brain, okay? It's called often the crocodile brain because it's literally, it's one of the most ancient aspects of our brain. It's like being a crocodile. So it's very primitive and it's the oldest part of our brain, millions and millions of years old. Then we have our limbic brain, which is where all of our sort of emotional aspects sits, our social social uh, way of being and so on. And then we have our neocortex, right? Which is the newest part of our brain. That's where all of our logical thinking comes in, our creativity, our ability to learn, our ability to imagine it is the newest part of our brain. And by the way, our brains are not fully developed until we're around between 21 and 25. So our humans' brains are developing for so long. And even after that, we are not fixed. Okay, we're not fixed. But how is the human condition therefore formed? Well, it's formed through our environment, which is at large culture, because humans are a, quote, social species, although we are programmed to be one because there's 8 billion of us and we have to coexist with each other. This conditioning happens from birth and at all developmental stages in life. From the age of zero to seven, your brain is literally like a sponge. You are just absorbing what's in your environment. How often do you see a parent tell a child something, but the child does what the parent does, not what the parent says? You are constantly setting an example to a child, especially under the age uh, of seven. And that's why a priest will say, give me the boy until he's seven and I'll show you the man because they knew how important that stage is for programming. However, after that as well, whether it be through parents, whether it be through school, whether it be through the work system and society at large, right? Expectations of society, it's continued to condition you simply through social programming, people around you. The biggest influence we have is our environment. And what is the biggest influence in our environment? Other people, guys other people so therefore who you have around you and what kind of lifestyle they're living is going to drastically impact yours which is again why your parents and how your parents lived and the proximity of your of your neighborhood and so on is going to have a heavy effect on the way that you 
that you choose to live your life. And it's very, um, it is focused on your body and your primitive reptile brain, because that is the part of your brain that is reactive. Okay, it's, it's automatic. It just, it, it's in and out. So if you, if, you, if you think of it as garbage in, they're giving you garbage. They're not giving you decent um, knowledge. They are conditioning you to be a certain way. They want you to become a cog in the machine. So when you get that garbage in and you're only filtering it through your reptilian brain, what are you going to get? Autopilot garbage out because it's coming from that lower part of your brain stem. It's coming from that most reactive part of your brain. It's not even reaching your, your, your cognitive aspect of your ability to think for yourself. So this is where the fear level of consciousness is programmed. And that starts as early as our birth and continues through all of our lives. It is literally societal, social engineered programming. So therefore what you consume in your environment matters a lot. Now your environment includes the thoughts that you consume, the emotions that you allow to continue to suppress, numb, entertain, or exacerbate, and also your own behaviors yours and those of others, extremely important, as well as, of course, what you consume in terms of information. Who are you listening to? Who are you taking advice from? What are you learning? Are you just mindlessly consuming entertainment and so on? It is a conditioned fear-based program, conditioned social conditioning, social engineering through other people, yeah? So, Important to understand, therefore, the human condition is not fixed. It is not human nature, okay? This is the power of your mind, which we're just scratching the surface of. This is quite literally a huge aspect of my life's work, is about understanding how we think and how we feel and how to do that for ourselves in the most practical and powerful way to live our purpose. The human condition is not fixed, and that's because we can learn and grow with neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is an amazing ability our brain has to create new pathways. Imagine like little, little electric sort of um, thunderbolts in your brain are, are, are firing all the time. And when you keep thinking a specific thought or you keep repeating a specific behavioral pattern or you keep the, uh, feeling certain emotions, you're constantly wiring and connecting a new connection in your brain, which therefore creates a new program, okay? And you can do that throughout life. There is no age restriction to that. So neuroplasticity is lifelong, meaning the good news, at any stage in any age of your life, you can rewrite the program. And we do that through neuroplasticity with our, by training our brain and our body, training thought and training emotion, and then therefore subsequently our behaviors. We master our thoughts and emotions and we bring the brain back into equilibrium, which I'll get into, and live in harmony with truth, to be in congruence with our self-image, which we'll talk about in a moment. And from that place, you're now putting quality in because you're, you're filtering through your learning prefrontal cortex. You're filtering through your neocortex, which therefore allows you to develop discernment, which, by the way, guys, is something you have to learn. It's a skill you have to learn. Thinking is a skill. It's not you're not born into it. Right. We have to learn it. And then therefore you get quality out, which is a conscious response through using your critical thinking, not just reacting from that reptilian brain. Yeah. So remember that what you consume matters and how you spend your most important currency, which is your attention, is the most important thing because your greatest currency is your attention. And that is being robbed in any given moment. Every single company that exists, consumerism, all of it is there to rob you of your attention because the more they can rob you of your attention every few seconds, you will never get to your thinking, conscious, discerning brain. You will always be stuck in your reptilian reactive mode, behaving out of a program, behaving like a robot and a cyborg. But that's not what you are. You are a higher conscience being. And the more you train and get into your conscious thinking mind, the more you have power over what happens in your reality. So how did we get here? How did we get to the human condition? Firstly, through willful ignorance. We are in the age of information. Information is available to every everyone everywhere the click of a button when i was growing up and i wanted to learn these things and i wanted to develop myself and get you know into all of the certifications and all those things learning about neuroscience psychology and all those things i'd have to fly somewhere book days off spend lots of money and really uh, be dedicated in terms of time and it'd be very difficult to find spots to achieve uh, and reach certain certain 
professionals and so on to get this information. Now you can get it with a click of a button and the majority of it is free, even so whether it be content like mine, or you have hundreds of hours of free content from me and many other teachers at the click of your fingers in the safety of your own home at any given moment. So in now, in today's day and age, to be ignorant is a willful choice. It's a willful choice. So that's how we got here. And that requires a switch. We also got here through attachment to the lower natures, people being attached to the lower nature of their human body and never tapping into their true selves of that higher consciousness. And attachment to your lower natures is always going to be of negative emotions. Yes, people get addicted to negative emotions and all negative emotions require a feedback loop that feeds itself because they're not self-sustaining. Higher emotions are self-sustaining. They don't need anything else. They just are. When you're in a loving state of frequency, you just are, you radiate it. it you, there's no lack there. In fact, people are drawn to you when you're in a state of love. But when you're in a state of lack, such as in, in shame or guilt, it's a reaffirming cycle. And it requires attachment to constant things externally to keep reinforcing that state of nature. Unfortunately, it's also self-loathing. The majority of people, not your fault, but most people believe they have a deep-rooted belief that I'm not enough. So they loathe themselves, their self-esteem is extremely low, and they use any form of external validation that they possibly can to reaffirm that they are actually worthy of existing and being in this world. And that is not your fault. That is a result to the way that the world has conditioned people to believe that that is life and that you can only gain any form of worth and recognition by getting it from society and culture which is simply not true and lastly it comes it's self-abandonment which is spiritual immaturity it is to think that you are just some body here you're just a body there's no spirit uh, and there's no no greater meaning to life we're all just here to pay bills drink beer play video games go to sleep go back to work and do it all over again until we die and that is spiritual immaturity that is to not see the bigger picture that is not to have tapped into the divine within you and to know that you have greater purpose here which means you've ultimately abandoned yourself and it's not anybody else around you that's abandoning you as much as you are doing it to yourself. And you're forgetting the very essence of the fact that you are here with purpose and you are significant just in the fact that you're here and you exist. How do we therefore move forward? Well, to start as we move to willful uh, curiosity, to willful learning, we switch to actually embrace learning every single day. How can I get 1% percent better every day when we engage our prefrontal cortex through learning we are literally training going into that conscious mind so therefore every day you are training the muscle of your spirit and you are nourishing your spirit with incredible inf uh, knowledge and wisdom rather than mindless entertainment that keeps you dumb keeps you stuck and keeps you a slave we embrace self-responsibility meaning that we understand at that point of courage I'm responsible for my life. I'm a sovereign being. There is no one outside of me that can make me do anything. They can try and enforce themselves onto me, but I am a divine human being that's sovereign and free, and I choose my own outcomes. I'm going to be responsible for every decision I make. That's where that phrase comes from in you are one decision away from a completely different life. That is absolutely true because every single uh, um, decision that you make is a life-changing decision if you actually make a new one and not just keep repeating the same pattern. We move to self-respect, which is to know deep down that you are enough, I am enough. I respect myself to actually have self-discipline, self-discipline being the highest form of self-respect. I respect myself enough to be conscious of where I put my greatest currency, which is my attention. Where am I giving my greatest currency? I'm stringent with it. I'm not just giving it out to anyone or anything. I know that my attention is my greatest currency. So therefore, I respect myself. I respect what I nourish my body with. I respect what I nourish my mind with. And I respect what I feed my soul with. And that comes down to I am enough. And then self-actualization being the biggest gift you can literally give yourself others and the creator simultaneously because self-actualization is for you to actually spiritually mature to understand moral law to be to be fully in alignment with the truth of the universe to be in alignment with the laws of the universe and to use your free will to actually become your most authentic version of yourself so that you can help the creator get to know itself through the only way that you can with your unique thumbprint you are one in 400 trillion chance that you even exist right now the way you look 
your essence, your traits. There will never be another you ever again in any different timeline, every any any uh, different age. Right now, who you are is with purpose. And to self-actualize is the biggest gift you can ever give yourself, anyone else, and the creator simultaneously. And spiritual maturity is where everybody needs to go because most people are still walking around injured children inside and they, and they have not fixed their abandonment wounds. And once we do, we mature and we go onto the authentic path versus the artificial path of the human condition. We move into the authentic path of living our most authentic truthful selves in alignment with the universe so what does it actually mean to be human what makes us human then if the human condition is not what human nature is and human nature isn't evil what is it i'll tell you in a moment first and foremost knowledge of the self your self your highest self your true self it breaks the conditioning spell and it unlocks your inner power because the conditioning absolutely is a spell. When everyone around you is like, what are you talking about? Don't try to think different. Why are you researching that stuff? Why are you looking into the meaning of life? Like, just get on with it. Like, just have a beer with us. Just get back to work. Just pay your bills. You've got responsibilities. Why are you thinking about that stuff? When you break out of that conditioning spell and you see it for what it actually is, it unlocks your inner power. It gets you to that point of courage that you can finally get into an empowered state. And that, my friends, is everything. That is the first stepping stone to spiritual maturity and to self-actualization. So I would assert from my own experience, from my own research, from my own knowledge and from my own workings with people and so on, that there are three aspects of human nature. The first being that we have free will, meaning we have the ability to choose how we respond to any given situation. We do have that ability to choose. You have not the free will uh, to choose what happens to you. You cannot control the environment, but you have every ability to choose your response. And that is our free will. Number two is that we are self-aware. We have conscience. We are actually aware. I am me. You are you. There is a distinction there, and I actually have the ability to either help you or harm you. That is moral agency. So we are self-aware, we have conscience, and we have moral agency. We have the ability to know the difference between right and wrong. That makes us a very big difference between us and animals, for example. Animals don't know this. The deer doesn't know it's doesn't call itself Daisy, and Daisy the deer doesn't say, I'm really mad at Bob the cat, my friend Bob the cat that didn't call me back. Like, what an idiot and like what did I do and they don't start ruminating and then like uh, uh, need psychotherapy right this only happens in humans because we have self-awareness we have that ability to differentiate and know and understand that we actually have the power to help and harm people that is our self-awareness and that actually goes hand in hand with the free will because our free will to choose in this third density to reality as human beings the positive path or the negative path of service to self versus service to others is required for us to have that self-awareness, conscience and moral agency. And it's part one of the biggest lessons we're here to learn uh, as human beings. And thirdly, is that we're programmable. We are malleable to a very high degree. That's why the human condition has worked and existed, worked in the sense that the engineers of this world have managed to actually achieve it but it's obviously not a good thing. It's a very negative thing. It's what's kept humanity enslaved via the mind. So we are highly programmable. Now you can look at that in a negative or positive way, but it's actually linked to the other two. It would be impossible for us to have free will if we weren't programmable, then we would be more like hive mind uh, animals, a bit like bees or, or ants are, you see? So therefore our ability to program ourselves and put in the program of what we wish is what allows us to have self-awareness and a personality and free will to choose. So you see how all three of them come together. And I actually think this is a very powerful thing to know and understand because it means that you can absolutely be the master of your own destiny. Not in any given case, but in the sense that you know and understand that you have free will to choose your response in any given moment. You do not have free will to choose how the consequences of your choices that is down to universal law. So I can go and smack somebody in the face down the street. That's my free will choice. My free will choice is not, however, the consequences of that, which would most likely be negative because that is down to universal law. So that's how those two are tied intricately together. And so the human condition is very much linked to 
the identity of who we believe we are and we will act in accordance we will behave in accordance with who it is that we think that we are all right it's our self image it's called psycho cybernetics and basically as everything stems from the mind we have a mental image of ourselves internally and when that mental image internally does not match our external reality then we will your brain will do everything it can to to make sure you can match that reality okay so that it's incongruent even if it's not good for you your brain is not designed to make you happy it's designed to keep you safe and do exactly what you tell it to do so that's why learning this is knowing and understanding you are not just a victim of circumstance you can change this all right what's the problem here is that most of humanity they don't know who they are at all because of the human condition they're living out a program from the environment around them and 95% of their behavior is a habitual pattern. A habitual pattern, meaning every single day, they're just, they're doing the same things, they're speaking to the same people, they're going to the same places, they're doing the same activities, they're feeling the same emotions and thinking the same thoughts. Sound familiar? And how do we get out of that? We get out of that by constantly tapping into the conscious mind and reprogramming that autopilot. We rewrite the program. We must break free from the mental cage to break free from the cage that we, ha that we have going on in the world. If we want to end physical slavery on this planet, which still exists today, just in various forms, everybody is enslaved bar the few that are the slave masters. We must first break free from the mental cage that we've enslaved ourselves into because we don't, people don't know their own power. And when you understand your own inner power, just like the slave masters of this world know, that, know as well, then you can break free from that mental cage. And that begins with every individual. And when we all do that individually, does that then reflect collectively in our results in the way that we live in the world, whether we live in a paradise planet or live in a prison planet? And this is all stemming into self-mastery. We do this with aligning to the trinity of truth, the trinity of truth being what we think, what we feel, and what we do being in congruence with one another. That will also shape that self-image I was talking about. So if you think one thing, but say another thing, if you think one thing, but then do something else, if you feel one thing, but then act another way, you are creating this incongruence. And the more you do that day after day, week after week, month after month, you've created more and more of a fake persona, okay? And that fake persona is, needs to be reaffirmed all the time. And your true self is over here, like gasping for air, like, hello, I'm trying to be seen. I'm trying to be livingly expressing my true self, but you can't because you're suppressing it. But when you align all three of them, which means to also be truthful, you cannot be authentic without being truthful. The two have to have to both correlate. The more truthful you are, the more honest you are, as in both to yourself and to others. And be honest, the amount of people that lie every day, all day they call white lies and what have you you know do you, are you in a job that you can't stand are you in a relationship that's no good for you are you uh spending money on things that, that are literally harming you are you know there's so many are you inactive and not taking care of yourself because you think you're not worthy all of these things link into this trinity and when they're not aligned when they're incongruent you will have issues you will have physical issues you will have mental issues and you will have spiritual disconnect so lining in these three is key. And I'm going to be focusing on thought and emotion here, but action is a, is a result of both of these together, which are very intricately tied. The question is always which comes first, thought or emotion. Ultimately, it's always thought first usually, but this, the timing between the thought and emotion is literally, it's so short, it's like a fraction of a second. And depending on how far you are in your life with how much experience, you may have habituated certain emotional patterns that now your body is driving the show before the thoughts even come in. You're, you're having a physical emotional reaction from habitual patterns because it's familiar. Yeah, so the, the two are very intricately connected. That's why I'm covering both thoughts and emotion in today's talk. So your thoughts matter for how you feel, how you behave and your results. Everything stems from the mind first. And language, uh, the language of the mind is thoughts. It's the narrative, it's the voice you hear. That's the language of the mind. Feelings being the language of the body. Now, interestingly, negative thoughts release chemicals in the body that instantly make you feel weak. 
physically. They physically make you feel weak. What does that look like? It looks like you're getting cold hands. You start sweating. Your breathing becomes erratic. Your muscles tense. Okay. You have difficulty thinking because you're not in your thinking brain. You're in your, your reptilian brain. The negative thoughts will actually take you into that survival mode. You will have poor brain performance, which will literally, it will literally make you more stupid. And you will, of course, physically feel worse. Okay. So it puts you in survival mode. And this is a very important point because for the majority of people, at least 70, at least 70% 70 of the thoughts they think on a daily basis are negative. So how do you think that shapes your reality massively? How do you think that's going to shape the way that you live, the decisions you make, the quality of your life, the condition we have on earth? Mm, it remains in survival mode. Positive thoughts, on the other hand, release chemicals that instantly make you feel strong. Remember, courage and above, empowered. Your hands become warm and drier. Your breathing slows down. You're calmer. Your muscles relax. Your brain productivity increases. So you actually become more intelligent. Why? Because you're not in survival. You're tucked into. It's safe. So you're tucked into your creative mind. This is actually something I teach often in my... Um, in the organizational workshops I do with leadership and team workshops and so on, is that when people are stressed out and burnt out, they can't be productive. You're literally not doing anywhere close to your best work when you're in a stressed emotional state. As you saw in the prior slide, you're literally dumbed down and you're in survival mode. So when you are in a happier, calmer mode, you are actually more intelligent and that's when you do your best work that's when you're most creative, most imaginative, you're most productive. So to be in a positive state actually puts you in your best performing state as well in terms of your work and purpose. That's why when I teach and talk about purpose and people often say to me, like, clearly you're on purpose because they can see and feel my energy when I'm doing this. Like, this is me, right? Because it's empowering and making me strong as I, as I teach this because it's so in congruence with my identity and in congruence with my strengths and my purpose. So it makes you feel happier as well. And it puts you in the creative mode. However, most people's positive thinking is extremely limited, extremely limited, because they keep defaulting to the negative thinking. And we'll get to why that is, because it's how you've trained your brain. And you can train your brain to be more positive than to be more negative. You absolutely can do that. So I want you to understand this, is that as you can see in this picture, your brain is, is literally like an antenna and all the sort of the, the thoughts that are coming in from the field. So all this sort of empty space around me, around you is not empty space. There's energy here and everything is energy, frequency, and vibration, just like the Wi-Fi connection. You can't see it, but it's there. It's a frequency and it's connecting us right now, right? Same thing is with thoughts. They're all around in the field and your brain is the antenna that takes them in so what does that mean it means that thoughts are not actually generated by you they're generated by the all mind the field outside of you they're responded to by your brain which is the antenna so hold on that means thoughts first of all are automatic they just happen about every three seconds so your ability to stop them is impossible, first of all. You cannot stop them. Don't try to do that because that literally would be a full-time job and it would be absolutely pointless waste of your time because they're just there. They're in the field. It's the, it's the reality that we live in. However, what you do have power over is how you respond to a thought. That is your free will choice. Think about that for a second. Not every thought that you think needs to be accepted nor responded to it's also not yours so i think about a lot of people talk about like intrusive thoughts or where did that thought come from and, da -da, and then they and then they start shaming themselves because they're like what a horrible thought why am i thinking that it's not yours you're taking it from the field you're not even discerning it and you're just Im immediately accepting it as true but who's even doing that discerning and saying oh where'd that thought come from it's the awareness it's the real you, the observer. And that's how you know the thoughts you think are not you. You are the awareness behind the thoughts. So as the thoughts start to come in from the field and there will be more and more of them, and if you live in a place with more and more people, that's why when you live in big cities and everything, it literally is 
a world full of noise, thoughts everywhere. When you're witnessing that, you can literally be like, it's like incoming call, incoming message. And you can just be like, no, thank you. Don't want that one. Decline, decline, swipe away. No, I like that one. Accept. And you start to practice that. Absolutely life-changing. I hope you wrote this down. How you respond to a thought is a free will choice. And this as well. You do not have to believe nor accept every thought that you think. How's that for a thought? When have you ever stopped to think like, is this thought I'm thinking even mine? Is this thought even true? Is this thought just coming from a belief system? Which by the way, a belief system is just a thought you continue to think and therefore have taken it on as an identity, as that self-image, which can change in any given moment because you can just create a new pattern. But you see this awareness is 90% of all transformation because once you know this, so all of the information you're getting in this presentation, you will literally be a completely different person at the end because the knowledge you have can never be like taken away from you now. You cannot unsee it anymore. That's the beauty and the power of knowledge. So you can learn to identify this negative thinking loop when you start to get all these negative thoughts and you attach onto them and you start creating this narrative. Oh no, that horrible thought. Oh my God, I forgot that thing. I'm such a terrible person. I'm I'm so unreliable. I keep forgetting these things. Well, none of those things are true. I just created a story there. You see how that was a nice little horrible negative story? That inner critic that everybody has, that's what that is. And you can learn to actually silence that, decline it, make fun of it, and not let it take over you. And you can replace it with positive empowering thoughts. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So remember that the images and words that you have in your head, you'll have a narrative going on, words, a voice, and you'll have images, right? You are not the voice nor the pictures in your head. They're all coming from memories of your life experiences, which are all from what? The past, the past. Why do we point backwards to the past? Behind you doesn't exist anymore except in your memory. And your memory is actually malleable as well. So every time you bring up a memory back, bring a memory back, you're actually reconstructing it. You physically have to reconstruct it, like the science of it. Is every time you bring up a memory, you're reconstructing it. And that's what the power of reframing is that you can reframe the narrative and reframe the images whenever you want and create a new story, an empowering story. You can never change an objective event that happened in your life. Let's be clear. What happened, happened. It is what is. That's the part you accept. What you don't accept or don't need to accept is the story you continue to tell yourself so that you continuously suffer and punish yourself for the rest of your life because of the story that you created around it. You can change that and shift to it to a new one that empowers you and allows you to, to learn from it, to grow from it, to become stronger and to, to, to live more and more out into your purpose. It's a completely different way of being because remember you'll behave in accordance with your self-image. And your self-image stems from the images and the words that you constantly repeat and play in your head like a record, which at any moment you can change. So we're going to shift the loop. What is the negative feedback loop? An example would be this. It starts with thoughts like, I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. Everything I try to do it never works out. So why should I even bother? And I deserve to suffer because I'm just, I'm just, I'm no good at anything. I'm useless. Everyone tells me that. It's just true. So therefore, what am I going to feel? I'm going to feel angry. I'm going to feel resentful of myself and others. I'm going to feel very sad and low. I'm not going to really have any energy. I'll be very weak, helpless, apathetic. What's the point, my bother? And of course, I'll be afraid, afraid to take any actions. I would avoid new opportunities. I'll stay on that autopilot because it's familiar and familiar equals safety. And therefore, I will not change my unhealthy habits, even though they are unhealthy and they continue to destruct my life. Why? Because it's reinforcing that I'm not good enough and I'm a failure and I deserve to suffer. Do you see how that works as a loop? Do you see how logically it actually functions perfectly well? Because if you tell your brain this, your brain is just doing its job. It's giving you exactly what you're asking it for. That's why when you understand that, that you're reprogramming yourself at any given moment, then you can shift it to the positive feedback loop, such as you change your thoughts to, I am worthy. I'm always doing my best. My best may not look the same every day, but it's still the best that I can do today. And that's good enough. I have purpose. I have meaning. I'm not here by accident. 
Therefore, I feel willing now. I'm willing to actually do something. I'm inspired. I have intrinsic motivation because my very existence has purpose and meaning. I'm now courageous because I'm willing to think, you know what, if I have purpose, if I'm, if I'm worthy, if I'm always doing my best, well, I'm going to actually try something new. I feel therefore strong in my higher conscience and I'm joyful. And when I'm joyful, I'm actually more intelligent as well. So I can start to become creative and, and do more amazing things in the world. So therefore, I'm open. I'm willing to learn. I do learn. I initiate things myself. I don't wait for things to come to me. I initiate. I improve my unhealthy habits because I am worth more than those unhealthy habits. I work towards a meaningful pursuit, which is my purpose, which is the way I came here to serve in the way that only I can. And do you see the difference in these two loops? You can take a screenshot of this, come back to it as often as you need, and you're going to create a positive feedback loop for yourself. We're going to do that as an exercise now. Remember that every thought that you think has a physical and emotional reaction in your body based on those images and words that you portray when you accept them as true. The moment you've accepted, so remember incoming thought and you've accepted one of them, bang, now you're having a physical response. Now the emotion kicks in. So you already know that you've accepted a thought as true when you start to get an emotion from it. You still have choice in that moment to say, no, that's false. I'm changing that. I'm shifting the pattern. And yes, as you do this in the beginning, it's going to take more willpower to change the habit. And then once it becomes a habit, here's the beauty of it, of the programming. Then the new healthy habit will become your autopilot program. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it anymore. Then it becomes automatic for you to think the positive thoughts. Then it becomes automatic for you to go for the new things. Then it becomes automatic for you to always do your best. You see? It literally becomes easier and easier and easier, but you have to train your brain to do it. So what does that look like? Well, if you feel unworthy, then you're going to continue to reaffirm your unworthiness through thoughts and actions. As I just said, if you're unworthy, you're going to constantly keep thinking that you're unworthy and you're therefore going to keep feeling those negative feelings and you're going to keep creating actions in your life. You're going to find evidence in the environment that that is true, that you're unworthy. Your brain will do that. OK, your brain will look for familiar patterns to meet your self-image. So I'm unworthy. Therefore, my brain is literally going to subconsciously bring people and circumstances into my life to confirm that for me, because my brain doesn't know the difference. It's just doing what I tell it to do. Remember, it works by repetition and it believes everything you tell it. This is why what you think, what you tell yourself, what you feel is extremely important. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it's not important. It is so important. Your brain's designed to do what you tell it and what you show it, not to make you happy. You are the executive of your brain, not the slave. Okay, you're not a slave to your brain. You're the executive of the brain because you are the conscious awareness deciding, no, I don't want that thought. No, I don't believe that stupid narrative that you keep telling me that I'm unworthy and therefore I should drink myself to sleep, right? No. I say no because I'm the conscious awareness brain and you're going to do what I tell you to do. This is very much not only possible, it is one of the most powerfully empowering things you ever, like once you start doing this, like the results speak for themselves, guys. Just try this out in your life for the next seven days once you've gone through this presentation and if you will see a drastic shift in the quality of your life. If you're just willing to actually try it, what have you got to lose? absolutely nothing. What have you got to gain? Absolutely everything, including your true self. And that's worth everything, is it not? I want you to write down a negative thought loop that you currently have in your life. Okay, I want you to reflect on that and write down a negative thought loop. You keep having negative thoughts, negative emotions, and the consequences, the actions that you have from that. And then replace it with a positive loop. And you're going to be practicing that for the next seven days. And you're going to continue, continue on after that. But I want you to dedicate yourself to that for the next seven days. And then once you've done it with one, you can do it with the next one, next one, and the next one. But just becoming aware of it, becoming aware of the pattern is the most important step. Because then can you actually do something about it? When you're not aware of the pattern, you can't do anything about it because you're oblivious. So make sure you do this exercise, write it down. What's the negative loop? And what's the positive reinforcing loop you're going to change it to? and start to practice it. You cannot wait for evidence for it to be true. It doesn't work like that. You have to start practicing and giving your brain the evidence that that's true. 
meaning you have to already change your behavior and your actions to be in congruence and accordance with the new self-image, the positive self-image you have for yourself in the positive loop. That will give your brain the evidence and then your brain will start to program that newly, which will start to create it more as an autopilot. That's why I said in the beginning, requires a bit more willpower, then it turns into the autopilot. You cannot expect it to just be autopilot when you've spent years on a different program. You require conscious willpower first before it becomes automatic. So you have to start the practicing, start the behavior, not waiting for evidence. You are creating the evidence because you're the creator of your life. And then it will start to become true to your brain as well. Okay. This is what we call cyber psycho cybernetics. And this is the science of your consciousness and your brain and how we create that new self image in any given moment. And remember that your body is objective and it doesn't know the difference between a thought and a real event. So when it comes to giving your brain evidence as well, you can do that also mentally. That's what we call mental rehearsal. Imagination is not the same as thoughts. Imagination comes from within you and it comes from your creative capacity and it's your ability to create and mentally rehearse the reality that you wish to see. It's very powerful. Your brain does not know, neither does your body, the difference between a thought and emotion, uh, sorry, a thought and a real event. So you can add that you need to do the behavior as well, okay, but add that to it and you will, you will start to create that cycle. Remember the, the trinity of truth. It's all coming together. So as we shift into mastering the internal world of emotions, and again, guys, this is just a couple of uh, insights and tools I'm giving you. I know it's actually quite a lot, but this is literally, we're barely uh, getting into the depths of the waters, which is what all my life's work is about. So you're, if you're actually wanting to dive deeper into this, you can go to my website uh, for trainings and courses and so on. But if you just implement the things that you're getting from this presentation, your life will completely transform. I'd like to start this one off with a story of a man called Phineas Gage. He was a manager of a railway company back in 1848. He was a lovely man, apparently. He was smart, he was funny, he was competent. He was, uh, all of his team members loved him. He had a, a wife and a family and he seemed to be a very wonderful man. But he became the most famous neuroscience patient in the world. Uh, neuroscience is one of the field of studies I absolutely love myself as well. And I've applied in many of my teachings and they absolutely work. But he was one of the first people to actually in, uh, have, have science uh, scientists realize the power of neuroscience and the power of our neurobiology in, in all of the things that I'm talking about to you, in everything, in our physiology, in the way we think, in the way we feel, and the way beha we behave. Why did he become the most famous neuroscientist patient in the world? Because he had an accident one day. So this was the railway station he was working on. And when you're making these apparently uh, railway stations, they had to blow up certain rocks in order to create the pathways. And one day it was raining and there wasn't enough staff and he decided to quickly um, blow up some of the rocks himself. So what he did is he was rushing, he was putting like the sand and the explosive in the rock and then you have to use a metal rod to like push it in and then it explodes. He did it a bit carelessly. Um, he didn't take his time with it. And unfortunately the rod exploded literally into his face and it went through, as you can see in this image here, it went through his entire skull and up and out of his skull and was found several meters away from his body. Miraculously, he actually survived this. Not only did he survive this, he got up himself and was able to take himself uh, to care, which is absolutely incredible. They managed to apparently fix him. He survived and he got back to life. However, he had a personality change. So even though he was physically capable, he went back to work, he seemed to be fine. Something drastically changed into his personality. He had a prefrontal cortex injury. So what we would call, again, the most newest part of your brain, where our logic sits, our rationale, our critical thinking, our learning ability, our creativity, and so on. But he became... His emotions changed. He became very aggressive, impatient, and he was unable to regulate his emotions. So he was just kind of very explosive, which was totally out of his character. However, he did still retain good logical thinking overall. He didn't really lose much intelligence. But most importantly here is that his decision-making ability was affected. He could not make the most simple decisions like, you know, about what they're going to need. What his wife would ask him, do you want to have some spaghetti or something else? And he just... He literally couldn't make a decision. And that was because it was tied to his inability to regulate emotions. So the point of this is, 
and they said he was no longer gauge like who he was wasn't the same anymore and unfortunately it didn't end very well for him a lot of things in his life sort of fell apart but this the study of this taught us that emotions are literally necessary to decide we cannot decide without emotions and this is surprising for a lot of people because they think that we make decisions purely rationally and logically which is not the case it's not the case at all i want you to think about it in your own life have you ever for example bought something that you did not need of course you have. I mean, let me give you a super simple example. Have you ever waited in a queue um, at the cashier? And because of your boredom, you do an impulse buy from the cashier. You buy some chewing gum or the lighter. You're not going to need the lighter. You're not going to need that. You don't need no chewing gum. You don't need the protein bar. But you bought it and took it because it alleviated the discomfort of boredom in that moment. So why did you buy it? You bought it because it made you feel good in the moment. You made an emotional decision about the purchase. It's not rational whatsoever. I can give you so many examples, but we haven't got time. That's just a very, uh, that's one that most people can relate to, okay? So we make emotional decisions on the most part, and then we post-rationalize them with a sense-making story, okay? So even the story I just told you would have given you, oh yeah, that makes sense. You wanted to alleviate the boredom by the, yes, but that was me sense-making the story. The action was completely irrational, it was just emotional. So remember always that story follows state, story follows state. So you make the emotional decision, think of the midlife crisis person that goes and buys the red Ferrari to feel good about themselves, completely irrational, can't afford it, looks ridiculous, but they wanted to feel good about themselves. So they buy the thing and then they follow up with a story like, yeah, well, you know, wanted to make an investment or it was this or whatever, right? And we all know that that's not the case. Story follows state. This does not have to be the way though. And the question is, well, what's the right way to go then? What is more conscious to make emotional decisions or rational decisions? Well, if we're hundred percent like uh, Phineas Gage and just rational with no, with no emotions, we actually can't make decisions and we would be extremely robotic. It would be wisdom without love, which is very wicked. That's what, that's what creates a lot of the issues we actually have in the world today, which is that people do not, um, they do not have this positive emotional intent when they're doing and creating inventions. They're thinking 100% rationally and they're being very logical and robotic and they're not considering the humanity in the heart, all right? But if we're 0% rational, if we're only em emotional, then we're like the crocodile. We're only reacting from that lower nature brain. So both of them are imbalanced. Both of these are not the right way to go. So what is the right way to go? The right way to go would be what I call the balance between the two, which is the wise mind. We make wise mind decisions. It's our ability to know that when the emotion is coming up, before we make the action, before we take the decision and physically carry it out, we tap in and clock into our rationale logic and say, ah, why am I doing that? Why do I want to buy that right now? Is it because it's just going to make me feel better? If I know that I only want to buy the cake because I'm I'm emotionally sad right now. And I know that if I eat that cake, I'm actually going to feel worse afterwards. That little sense, that little bit of logic brought in there will actually save you from a long-term negative effect of that emotion. You see, that would be you buying into lower nature emotions. But higher nature emotions is when you do something out of love and true care. When you when you do make decisions, decisions out of emotions to do good, for example. So that's absolutely beautiful. So it's knowing and understanding the context. Are you doing it from your higher consciousness or from your lower nature? Very important. So you start to choose your equalizer consciously. You're choosing. So as it's coming up, you're not just going straight to logic or straight to emotion. You're balancing out the wise mind. What is the best decision in this moment, in this context, with what I'm dealing with? thinking long-term as well, not only momentary, and not based on my past, which is a repetitive program. So when you do this, you can choose wisely rather than being a slave to this balancing swing of the pendulum. Because when you're a slave to your lower natures, every time you seek pleasure, a lower pleasure, a lower form of pleasure, the balancing swing is gonna smack back out into your face with the, with the seeking and lack. You're going to start to feel lack and therefore you're going to need more and more and more of the thing that made you feel good to feel anything at all anymore. And that's how we become completely imbalanced. And the thing is, your brain is always seeking that equilibrium and imbalance. That's why, um, you know, when you cross your legs naturally or when you naturally cross your arms, that is literally because your brain is constantly seeking this dance to like merge uh, and um, and your two brain hemispheres, the, the right brain and the left brain are literally constantly 
creating this equilibrium and balance. And so that's why your physiology does it as well without you even realizing. And you can actually tap into a lot of tools to do that too, like dancing, for example, or martial arts and uh, hiking and all kinds of things, okay? So when we look at mastering emotional intelligence, which is a huge topic, but it's a very important, we need both emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence. So remember, love without wisdom is foolish. Wisdom without love is wicked. We need both. And when we also master those two, we are also balancing masculine and feminine energies within us in our most authentic way, which creates our unique power in the way that we deliver our purpose and our life force in this world. And you can really see that in a person when they're balanced. And when they're imbalanced, you can also see it because they are a slave to their lower natures and they're very easily swung with that pendulum. Mastering emotional intelligence looks like first understanding our emotions. This is a very interesting thing to consider and look at for yourself, which is where the sensations in your body occur, uh, depending on the emotion. So if we just take our anger as an example, what do you personally feel uh, when anger comes up? What's very common is for people to start getting like a very um, fast heartbeat. Their hands will start to feel tingly. Perhaps your head will get hot. That is a physiological response to an emotion very important to understand because when you start to recognize sensations then you can become aware of them before you respond to them that's the whole point okay so let's look at that for ourselves let's do a bit of a self-reflection exercise this is going to build your emotional intelligence and train that wise mind that non-reactive mind so i want you to do this properly in your own time afterwards you can take a screenshot and do it in your own safe space but let me go through this quickly with you I want you to consider how do negative emotions feel inside your body. First, focus on the negative emotions. Remember, negative means they feel bad. Not that they're bad emotions, but they feel physically bad in your body. How do they feel and where in your body do you feel them? Literally draw it out. So like you see this image here, draw it on your body. Start to become really familiar with this. How many people have absolutely no idea how anything feels in their body? Because they dissociate. And we want to bring ourselves back to our embodied states because that empowers us. You want to identify the sensations in the body and name the emotions associated with them. Why do we do this? Because we can then become aware that when it happens in the moment, when we react, when we are stimulated by something in our environment, we can learn to recognize the sensations and label the emotion and therefore know what to do with it rather than just react to it. We're tapping into that awareness. I want you to then do the same thing for the positive emotions and notice the difference between the negative and the positive in terms of the sensations in your body and become aware of the physiological responses to your emotions. This is so powerful. And lastly, I want you to write down what are your triggers for the negative emotions because this is the where a lot of your core work is going to be. You're not triggered by a positive emotion, right? Positive emotions can have anchors. You can have anchors in your environment that you can stimulate more of your positive emotions for you. Absolutely. Haven't got time to get into that now, but I want you to focus on the negative triggers because those are the things that people usually struggle with, regret, causes issues in their lives and their relationships, is understand what is triggering the, triggering the negative emotions for you. So therefore, you know, okay, what are the stimuluses I need to not only avoid, but when they come up that I have to process them in a different way with my emotional intelligence to know that it's a trigger coming up and it's not necessarily the actual current event, that it's coming from my past programming and I need to heal and learn to, to improve that. And I just want to show you something I call 90 seconds to wisdom and freedom, which is that um, physiologically speaking, it takes about 90 seconds for an emotion to literally move out of your body because emotion is energy in motion. And when you literally allow yourself to feel, which basically nobody does because society teaches you to numb yourself and to not feel your emotions, even though your emotions is literally what makes you uh, an amazing human being. When you allow emotion to just express and go through your body and you have that emotional intelligence, it takes about 90 seconds to leave your body. For most people, it gets stuck because you suppress it and you keep it stuck in your body and it turns into physical disease and physical illness, or it turns into also mental um, instabilities uh, and struggles because you are not addressing the root cause. You're not addressing the emotions every time they come up and the signals they're giving you. So first of all, when an emotion comes up, recognize the sensation in your body as it arises. I'm feeling anger. Where do I feel it? Oh, I know that feeling. I know that feeling in my hands. I know I'm starting to feel anger. First thing, you recognize it. Second is you observe your impulse of your body that wants to react. That's your non-conscious programming coming up. You observe and recognize it. 
once you've done this, that's a small victory. You're going to have to practice this. You're going to fail at it and you're going to do, you're going to do well at it as well. The more you practice, the more you will get better at this. You take a deep breath with a longer exhale, like a long sigh. Okay. You allow yourself to feel the feeling. You don't fight it. You don't try to suppress it. You don't try to project it onto anyone. You allow yourself to feel it through your body. That may involve not just sitting there and feeling it. It may involve you dancing, doing some kind of karate, you know, going for a run, literally voicing it, right? There are different ways to allow body, the sensations uh, to come through your body, depending on the emotion, but literally feel the feeling. Do not fight it or suppress it. It wants to move through your body. And that is the healthy thing to do. It will not kill you to feel your feelings. It is absolutely imperative that you do. You bring yourself then back to neutrality before you respond. And then therefore your response will be more conscious. It won't be coming from your programming. It will be coming from your creative conscious mind, which means you're tapping into the field of possibility and you're literally becoming a new person in that moment. So every time you do that, it is a victory. And it is so liberating when you start to do this. And when you start to actually, even just once, when you manage to achieve it, you will then get that motivation to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And you'll start to realize the power you've had within you the whole time. And this is the work, guys. This is the work. This is my life's work. I embody this. I live this. And I teach this every day. I live for this stuff. We must mind the gap between stimulus and response. In that gap is your conscious choice as to how you're going to respond in any given moment. That is your freedom. That is your free will. That is your gift from the creator. And every time you do this, you are developing your spiritual muscle. You're allowing that space for your true conscious awareness to come through and not to just react from a physical program. This is how you train higher consciousness, guys. This is how you train higher consciousness. This is the work, the life work which allows you then to start living with purpose, mastering your strengths and doing that. If you want to actually ignite your life purpose, I have an entire course on this. But this is the work, guys, and it's so worth it. So when you try to control everything through pure logic and you think that you can predict how everything's going to go, this is how you look when you're doing that. It's impossible. We cannot control the environment. We cannot control other people. We cannot change other people. We can only look at what are we doing? How are we behaving and how are we responding? I tell you right now, when you change within yourself, how you're reacting, the environment around you will also change. People around you will have to change the way they behave with you because the fact that you've started to embrace your true self and you're not just reacting to the way that they treat you you know so you might be thinking like i don't understand why it's not working out i planned everything logically that's because emotion trumps logic a lot of the time you need both you can't suppress your emotions you can't pretend that you're purely rational i know people love to think this it's not weak to have emotions it makes you human Logic isn't the answer to everything. Emotions are necessary to decide. We've scientifically proven this. And you can see this to be true in your own life, okay? The most painful thing anyone can literally go through in life is heartbreak. It's so painful, people will literally die from it. So understand that emotions are literally a part of us being human and we're not here to suppress them. We're here to embrace them and learn how to emotionally, intelligently process them with our logic, with our learning, with our wisdom, with our ability to discern and learn from the situation. The wise mind is therefore key to aligning with your true self, not your reactive fear conditioned program, not the human condition, your true, most authentic self that the creator had intended you to be from the beginning. So you want to shift your story to master your life. You do that with this reinforcing positive loop. The more you continue to do this with more thoughts, you will become a completely new person. And by new, I mean the true you will be uncovered. Not new as in some fake person, as in the real person that was there all along, but was suppressed from all of the programming that you had to unlearn and remove from your from your mind because you will behave in accordance with who it is you think you are never forget that so it all starts with your thoughts changing this positive thinking loop uh, as often as you can will bring you new results better results and it will align you with the universe and the universe will reward this the universe rewards the hard work the universe rewards people that actually take the conscious effort to be on this uh, conscious evolution journey and to be aligned with truth Remember that your unexpressed emotions, they don't ever die. 
they don't go anywhere. They're buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways, as Sigmund Freud said. That is absolutely true. So as I would therefore say, you've got to self-regulate in order to transmutate. It is literally inner alchemy. It is literally your ability to self-regulate, knowing and understanding these emotions, knowing how to tie in your logic, and then therefore transmuting your lower nature to your higher nature. It's literally inner alchemy. That's what it means to be the wizard, the magician. You can do this. It's absolutely possible. You can train this. This is the life's work. And the more you learn to self-regulate, the more you learn to come home to yourself, reparent yourself, you will become the master of your life. This is how we break free from the mental cage. This is how we rewrite the program. And this is how we master ourselves. It all begins with thought and emotion, which therefore subsequently impacts our actions, which changes our results. All three need to be aligned to the trinity of truth. You can absolutely rewrite the program in any given moment. You just have to be willing to do the work. Remember that you are your best investment. Everything you've just learned here can never be taken away from you. That's what I mean by investment. Not necessarily financial, but the investment in your own knowledge, your own education, your own conscious growth, nourishing your soul, nourishing this physical vessel that you're here to experience this life with. You are your best investment applied knowledge applying this knowledge is the most powerful thing power, knowledge by itself is not powerful it's your application your priority you prioritizing intentional growth is what matters because growth is not automatic guys aging is aging is automatic you don't have to think about that you'll get older regardless but growth doesn't come with aging you're not 20 years wiser just because you're 20 years older many of my students and clients are much older than me and they learn a lot from my wisdom because it's got nothing to do with age. It's all to do with experience and applied knowledge. So the more you apply the knowledge, the, the wiser you will become in your growth and you'll be able to take this path in an empowered way versus a sort of scattered way throughout life where you feel like everything's just sort of happening around you and you can start to direct your energy more consciously. You can learn more at livingtraininggeurope.com where I have many courses, I have workshops, I have trainings. Um, there's also plenty of free content. I have a podcast, I have a weekly newsletter, I have many videos, endless hundreds of hours that you can dive into if you truly want to do the work because it's always the right time, guys, to start living from within. The creator made you to start living from within. So with that, I just want to leave you with the message that above all, be true. Be true to yourself, be true to others, be true to the creator, which means to be honest. Be honest in everything that you do, be aligned with the trinity of truth and ensure that you are always doing your very best in life to be on that positive path in your most authentic trajectory of self. So till next time, thank you. <laughs>